Genshin Impact's overarching story has begun to lurch forward. Throughout most of the story, the Traveler has only been reacting to things that have happened. But recently, there are things moving behind the scenes that most of the protagonists have yet to notice. It was only as recent as 3.3 that we were told about how fate worked in Tevat. And now, in the most recent Dineslave quest, it's revealed that the movement of our presumed enemies have been happening for hundreds of years. In this quest, we are introduced to yet another mysterious figure. But who exactly is this person, and is their appearance a signal that Tevar is about to face an age of great turmoil and strife? Before we dive deeper into this mystery, if you want to see more Genshin Impact content, do consider subscribing to the channel. Now just a word of warning, this video will have a bunch of spoilers if you aren't caught up with the Archon quest in 3.5. So consider this your spoiler warning. In the 3.5 Dineslave quest, or more accurately the Archon quest chapter 3, Caribear, we are given a glimpse of the origins of the Abyss Order. The bulk of the story sees the Traveler assisting someone by the name of Ida, who is from Kenria, in healing his son who has been turned into a Hilichel because of a curse. Halfway through the story, we enter an unknown sanctuary, located beneath the border of Sumeru and the Chasm. Inside, we witness several Hilichels kneeling and bowing their heads as they make their way further into the sanctuary. While we don't know what they are exactly doing, it is suspected that they are in fact praying, or at the very least showing reverence to something that lies deep within this location. At the very centre of this sanctuary, the Traveller finds a large door and is confronted by a Cryo Abyss Herald. Surprisingly, the Abyss Herald does not immediately attack, but mentions that an audience cannot be granted at this moment. Because the Traveller insists on entering, the Herald proceeds to put him through the Trial of Destiny. This whole Trial of Destiny thing alludes to a whole other part of the quest, but I'll cover this in a separate video on the Loom of Fate. Essentially, the Traveller and Ida are permitted entry, and in the next room is something I can't even begin to describe. I don't even know what this thing even is, but functionally, it looks like a giant rock, suspended in the center of the room by chains, and emanating the same energies the Traveller saw during the very first Dineslave quest. The Traveller even experiences the same foreboding atmosphere they had experienced when they saw the stolen and altered Archon statue, but to a much higher degree. During this whole thing, Ida behaved completely opposite from the Traveller. While the Traveller instantly sensed the Abyss and became extremely cautious, Ida instead viewed this thing as something to be revered, like a god. A voice then spoke directly into the mind of the Traveller, and while it mentioned several things, it most importantly identified itself as the Sinner. And this is where we get into the meat of this video. Who exactly is this Sinner and what did this all mean? When trying to answer this question, any sort of plausible answer really just becomes a theory. This is mostly because we don't know much about the Abyss, Kenria, or anything that happened 500 years ago during the Cataclysm. As I mentioned, this incident happened in the past and was the origin point of the Abyss Order itself. The Traveller also felt the presence of the Abyss while in the Central Chamber, and so it would make sense for us to start there. The first idea that comes to mind is that this being is in fact either a god or maybe the king of the abyss. The Sinner mentions itself that it is in fact not a god, but perhaps this was more because it does not want to associate with the gods we are familiar with, especially if it really was from the abyss. It's likely an extremely strong entity from the abyss in either way, as it was shown to imbue Ida and Karibar with the power of the abyss itself. If the abyss was populated by different beings, I would assume only the strongest would be able to accomplish this. Much like elemental power, not all humans can wield it, and only the gods have the highest control over it. So my first guess would be that this sinner is a god or high ranking member of the abyss. However, since we know too little about the abyss and whatever power hierarchy or ruling class it might have, this idea really devolves into just a guess purely because of the relationship this thing has to the abyss. An alternative idea could be hypothesized based on what Dineslave mentions at the end of this quest. When the traveller relates this story back to Dineslave, his reaction seems to imply that he knows who it is, or rather has an idea. Dineslave even claims that if it is who he thinks it is, then this person would have likely seen the Traveller despite this just being a memory. So my second guess is this might be someone Dineslave personally knows, and that means it's likely to be someone from Kenria. 
For a while now, the story has slowly started to introduce several Kenria residents. Aside from Dinesliff, we also know that the leader of the Harbingers, Piero or the Jester, used to be one of the royal court magicians of Kenria. You then have the reveal of Kea Alberic and his ancestors who are high position nobles of the Kenria Empire that went on to form the Abyss Order. Finally, we also have the Alchemist Gold, the creator of Albedo and the person largely attributed with the creation of monsters during the Cataclysm. But while most of these characters are high-ranking individuals, the highest authority in Kenria has secretly been hidden from most players. This individual has been mentioned in game, but only in text and hidden lore. So the next potential candidate is Ermin, the last king of Kenria. Compared to a god or a king of the abyss, Ermin is a far more likely candidate and here's why. Hidden away in the Pale Flame artifact set lore is the story of Piero the Jester. It claims that during the time of Kenria, Piero had lost the favour of the then king, which is implied to be Ermin. This was because Piero lacked sufficient knowledge, but what this knowledge is, we don't really know. It goes on to then say that because Piero fell out of favour and due to his lack of knowledge, he could not prevent the king and his sages from tearing away the veil of sin. This action supposedly brought upon Kenria the divine punishment of Celestia. Now again, we don't know what this veil of sin is, but in the quest, Clothar mentions that right up to the end of the Cataclysm, Kenria was pursuing an alternative avenue of power. He claims that the Abyss was what was supposed to free the people of Kenria from the fates they had been decided for them. As such, it's fairly reasonable to assume that in search of power and the loom of fate, Irmin likely had his sages peer into the abyss itself for a solution instead of relying on gods or Celestia. This most likely caused Celestia to brand them as sinners for attempting to make use of abyssal powers, something that stands opposite to them. This whole decision might have made it seem like Kenria wished to move away from the system Celestia controls and thus brought upon the cataclysm to their nation. On top of that, they were described to have torn the veil of sin and while we don't know what this is, it's likely what caused them to be branded as sinners, especially the king. It would also be safe to assume that Ermin might be a well-experienced and knowledgeable person in arcane magics given that he has a court of magicians advising him. This might be what allowed him to peer through time and even memory to see the traveller in the present day, assuming the sinner is really Ermin. It would also explain why Dinesliff might know him since he was the royal guard captain and likely would have directly reported or known the king himself. As compelling as the idea of Ermin being the sinner is, there is one more candidate that might fit the bill here. Tevar was originally formed by the primordial one who was external to Tevar. He reshaped the world for the humans after driving away the elemental dragons back to their realm. For a while, humans lived in utter contentment and had every one of their needs catered for. However, after an indeterminate amount of time, another being external from Tevat had arrived. This being became known as the Second Who Came or the Second Throne. It was said that this caused a massive war to break out between the Primordial One and the Second Who Came, both wanting control over Tevat. Eventually, the Primordial One supposedly won and what happened to the second who came remains a mystery. It is potentially possible that this voice we hear refers to the second throne as contesting the Primordial One likely made him the first sinner. Perhaps this giant floating rock is a prison used to detain him but over the years his influence was able to leak out, dominating and corrupting all within his reach. It's also entirely possible that the second throne may have overlaps with the abyss theory but we can't really know for sure since we know little about these two areas. Even if we do not know exactly who this floating evil looking rock is, their appearance signals a shift in the story, almost as though the great enemy in the shadows has begun to move. With the sudden appearance of the sinner and the exposition on the Alberic family, I suspect that we are currently experiencing the calm before the storm the moment before all hell breaks loose. We have seen progressively that as the traveller visits each nation, the Archons are slowly either retiring or cutting ties with Celestia. If this pattern continues, by the end of the traveller's journey, the conditions might be perfect for Celestia to be attacked or even overthrown. I think this story is just the beginning of a time of strife for Tevat, 
and there are signs that show the resurgence of both Kinria and perhaps the Abyss will begin in earnest. We will just have to wait and see if Genshin Impact really gets a war arc. Now, I do need to remind you that these are largely just theories, and we can't be too sure on these sort of things. It's equally likely that any of this turn out to be true, or maybe this person is a completely new character yet to be introduced. So just keep that in mind. That does it for this video though, and if you enjoyed it, do consider liking and subscribing to the channel. Leave in the comments who you think the sinner is, and I'll see you in the next one. As usual, have a nice day.